I am very excited about this next session that we have going here. It is with my good friend, colleague, co-host, and boss, <laughs> Scott Hanselman. Um, we're going to be talking about .NET Everywhere, and you, you really put this to the test, didn't you, Scott? You, uh, you really wanted to push all boundaries of how .NET can literally be anywhere you need it to be. Yeah, well, David Fowler uh, went and uh, put a tweet out a couple of days ago. He was waxing philosophic about the past, and he saw this tweet, which was a picture of he and I at a conference, I think in 2014, and he was on a Mac, and it was quite the scandal at the time. And, uh, and now here we are putting .NET everywhere, in the cloud, in WebAssembly, on Macs, on iPhones, on Android. But I wanted to showcase some of the cool places that it's being used where you might know it's being used and some places where it's being used that you may never have thought, oh gosh, I had no idea that, that was .NET, you know? I didn't know my TV ran .NET. And uh, I, I brought my bag and I bought a whole bunch of stuff here with Tons stuff I carried all the way from Portland to show us. So I'm gonna do my very best and hopefully it won't suck. <laughs> all right, let's see it. <laughs> all right, cool. Hey friends, we are at the End of the first day of .NET Conf. I'm going to call this the lock note. If Hunter got to open it up, I'm going to close it down. And then we're going to go into the virtual attendee party and do all kinds of fun stuff as we get ready for days two and three. So I've got my machine right here. And um, this is a Surface Laptop Studio. This is actually my own personal machine. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of context as we run around and what we're doing here. First, I've got uh, the Windows Terminal, which I like to use. And I've used Oh My Posh to go and bling out my... Uh, prompt here, and I've got two panes open. You can see that I'm in the GitHub folder on this side. So I go PWD. You can see I'm on C colon GitHub where I keep my code. On the right hand side over here, I've got Ubuntu. Ubuntu, uh, this is running under WSL. And if I go and run LSB underscore release dash A, you can see that this is in fact Ubuntu 2004. And I've gone so far as to put the graphics in the corner. Uh, thank you for the friends at PowerShell Magazine for letting me use that graphic. That way I can keep track of these things. And if I pull down this top menu here, you can see I'm using PowerShell as my default prompt. That is actually PowerShell 7.2. PowerShell 7.2, in fact, came out just yesterday, in fact, using .NET 6. So it released, it's sim shipped, as they say in the Microsoft world. It's simultaneously shipped with .NET 6. PowerShell used to be called PowerShell Core. Now it's just PowerShell. Works everywhere. The great thing about PowerShell, which is pwsh.exe, is I can write scripts and they will run on Windows, they'll run on uh, Ubuntu, they'll run on a Mac. So it's an optional shell that you can use anywhere and I happen to use it not only as my preferred shell, but also uh, my, um, my orchestration scripts and stuff like that. So there's somewhere that you didn't necessarily know you were using .NET PowerShell, uh, now cross-platform certainly, and running on .NET 6, which is cool. Now on the left-hand side here, we've got my, uh, my code like my um, Hanselman personal website. And you notice here when I go into that folder, we've got the Oh My Posh prompt here that's showing my current branch and the current version of the .NET SDK that I happen to be running in that folder, which is interesting. If I go up a little bit and I go down into another demo uh, that I might show you a little bit later, you can see that when I get into that folder, that folder is using .NET 5, so I haven't yet updated that one uh, particularly. And if I go uh, back up to that Hanselman blog location, there we go. I'm going to drop into that folder, and I'm going to go ahead and close that pane, and I'll say .NET Run. PowerShell, of course, giving me that nice predictive pop-down history there. That details about that are on my blog. And you'll see that it popped uh, up a couple of URLs here. We've got localhost 5000 HTTP, HTTPS, the secure one is 5001. You'll notice that if I hover over those, because I'm using Windows Terminal, I can go and click on that and it'll actually bring up the browser for me. And then there's my personal website that happens to be running on localhost. Now that's localhost 5001 running on Windows, which is cool. I'll hit Control C. We're going to come over here. I'm going to click on Ubuntu. I'm going to hold down Alt with my left thumb, and that's going to pop open that other pane on the side there. So again, I've got Windows on the left, and I've got Ubuntu on the right. We'll zoom in a little bit, make sure that everyone can see that, and I'll go and open up the Hanselman core. And I'm going to say .NET dash dash info here, and we can see that I've got both the .NET SDKs, .NET 5, and the new LTS, the long-term support version of .NET 6.0, running in this folder right here. So I'll say .NET run. Um, Certainly, I could use uh, Visual Studio Code if I felt like it. And then you can see right there, once again, localhost 5000, localhost 5001. Go and click on those. 
bring that up, get my little security warning, that's okay. Um, and actually, this is an interesting one here. Sometimes when you do demos, little things break. And the reason that this is breaking is it says right here that you can't visit localhost right now because the site uses HSTS, HSTS that um, forcing things to be secure. And it doesn't like that shirt authority is being invalid. So as I recall, I have to go in here and, and go and clear the HSTS cache. And I always forget the way to do that. And it's usually Chrome net internals or Edge net internals. So I'm gonna go and drop into that. And then we'll go down here into our net internals and it looks like it moved on edge. So let's do that again. And this is gonna go and clear some domain security policy that's way, way, way down here. Domain security policies for local host. And that happens sometimes when you're doing work with uh, HTTPS on, um, uh, you know, on multiple sites. We'll go ahead and uh, try that one again. And if I fail to do that, we'll move on. Okay, I'll switch back over to my terminal and we'll bring up localhost 5000 after having run that. Get that error, continue on to localhost, and there's my website again, okay? We cleared that HSTS error, that was a local domain security policy. And you see right there, localhost again, isn't that interesting? So wait a second, we've got Windows and we've got WSL, it's a different machine. Well, it's not because WSL is actually port forwarding that 5001, that's in fact, being opened up on the Linux side of things, but it's being made available to me on Windows, which is great. And that just showcases that nice experience that you get when you're on Windows. You can develop on Windows, you can develop on Linux, you move back and forth. And in this case, my browser doesn't mind because that correct port is being forwarded and I'm using my Windows-based browser, which works really great. We'll pop back out into um, here. And another thing that I could do, and I happen to do this, I believe, with my podcast website, and these are all just my personal sites. This is all stuff that I do on the side. It's got nothing to do with my day job. But one of the things that's nice when you work on .NET is to have a project that you do on the side that makes you happy, and my podcast makes me happy. Remember that I said that I use PowerShell scripts to go and uh, work cross-platform. I'm also using Docker and Docker containers, which allows me to do stuff cross-platform. These are really simple little scripts. There's really nothing here. If we go and look at one of them, we'll take a look at Docker build. This one here has what's called a hash bang at the top, and that means that we'll use that particular Linux application when I run that script, but it will be ignored on Windows because it uses a .ps1 extension, which means that I can run this script on Linux or Windows and it works in both places, which is super nice. And that's just gonna go and build my podcast with Docker. So I'll go and say Docker build, and we'll do that. And then we'll get some nice um, ASCII art here as we ran through all of that. It looks like that was previously cached from me building before. We're using Docker Desktop, and Docker is actually using WSL and using Linux as that, that engine. So underneath that is the Linux subsystem that we have built into Windows. When we went and did that, I can go now and I could say Docker Images, and I can see that we've got one tagged podcast. Now we saw earlier with both Scott Hunter and David Fowler, they were talking about the Azure Container Apps stuff, which is pretty cool. I wanna go and take those Azure Container Apps and, and use them. Um, but I wanted to see how quickly and how easily I could put a potential website up into the cloud by just pushing it, right? I have some, got a Docker thing here, .NET 6 just came out. Maybe I can go and do that. So what I can go and end up doing is I can tag, I can tag with Docker tag that latest podcast build with S. Hanselman Hansel Minutes, which is the name of the podcast that is then sitting on Docker Hub. Well, let's go over to Docker Hub. I'm allowed to have one free uh, one free private repository. I could also use the Azure Container Registry if I wanted to. And then I just have to say Docker push S. Hanselman and then go to this particular registry. So I'm gonna push a tag up to that registry. And then over here, last night, I went into my container app to learn about how this stuff works. And it was pretty cool. I can go and make what are called revisions and I can have like different versions, different revisions of my stuff. And I went and pushed in just one push the, the Hanselman its website up to Azure Container Registries. They gave me this free kind of wacky URL here, azurecontainerapps.io. I happened to use one that was in the central part of Canada. I'll go and maybe put something in front of that like Azure Front Door and then put a, UR, uh, a URL that's friendlier on that. And there you go. There is an actual running instance of my website running out of containers. And it works just great immediately had no trouble at all once I figured out how to do that deployment. Now I did not do continuous deployment. 
I didn't use the Azure Container Registry. I just pushed that directly with um, the, the, uh, the Docker hubs. But you can go and do this any way that you want. So here I did manually, I said create new revision. And then I have a container image here. I could choose from the Azure Container Registry here or I pick the Docker hub. I have a private one, I logged into Docker and then I was able to push my website running up there. And in fact, uh, Glenn Condren, who we uh, talked to a little bit earlier today, uh, has uh, the username Glenn C over on Docker Hub, and he and I did an, a demo, and I wanna say it was probably five or six years ago when we were first thinking about doing this stuff cross-platform, and it was called Fancy Pants. It was the Fancy Pants demo, and he said to me earlier today that people are still pulling that Docker demo down, and it still runs, it still runs that version of .NET just exactly as it was because that's how containers work. So containers are a great place to find uh, .NET and .NET 6. You can go and uh, take a look at how we did that. And if I pop back to Ubuntu, check this out. Let's drop into Ubuntu and we will hop over into that folder or one of these folders. Actually, I'll go back into the podcast folder here. Da, 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 da. Pause for effect. I'm going to say code dot. Visual Studio Code is going to split in half. And it's going to install the Visual Studio Code server. And then it's going to have the Visual Studio Code front end. And inside that, I'm going to open up my Docker file. And I've actually got a multi-stage Docker file. This one here is using .NET 5. And I'll upgrade that soon to .NET 6. And you can see that I'm building a layer. I'm copying the SDK in, I'm making sure that all, remember I'm copying all the code in. The SDK rather here is tagged right there. And then later, I can go and actually run the tests exactly in the container, the same container I'm gonna be running in, I can go and run those tests. Then I can publish and make another layer and here I can pull in the ASP.NET 5 runtime. And it's gonna be really easy for me to update that to six because those containers are already out in public. I'll just change that number from five to six on both the SDK and the runtime. And that container will run anywhere, any cloud, any time, whether it be locally on my Windows machine using WSL or whether that end up being in the cloud, which is pretty fantastic. Okay, so let's drop out of there. And I'm gonna go ahead and close Visual Studio Code here. I'm gonna show you something else that's interesting. We go up to the .NET website. Oops, that's my email. We go back up to the .NET website and I'm gonna say .NET slash learn to code. Learn to code. And we're gonna end up right here. And we've got a really cool pan thing going on where the paparazzi, they're following us around. They love the .NET developers. So you've got my, my friend here with the, the mobile camera going. If you go up here to .NET slash learn to code, this is really cool. This is actually a education pack. This education pack works on both Windows and Mac, and it includes the .NET interactive notebooks. This is a really interesting place you might not have expected to see .NET. Now I already have .NET and VS Code, so instead of downloading the pack right here, which I would encourage you to try, try it at home, works on any machine, I'm just gonna click here where it says get started with the C Sharp 101 Notebook. I'm going to no, click on that. I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and we're going to bring up Visual Studio Code, which apparently has decided to update itself because that's the time, really, updating yourself when I'm doing it. Next step will be for my system to decide that it's the time to defrag because when you do live television, that's the time to do your defrags, right? So what we've got, we've done here is we've opened up this file here. This file is called a dib file, .NET Interactive Book. You can also use an IPYMB, which is the Python notebook extension. And what's neat about this is we've got some pros, right? We've got some pros here. We're reading a book inside of Visual Studio Code that is written in Markdown. And then if I hover, if I hover over one of these, look at this. I've got that console.write line here and I can run that. And it's actually gonna run that cell, that piece of code right there is actually running right there. So I can go down and say, oh, how does that work, huh? Jamie's my friend, cool. Change that, we'll say Scott. I've got IntelliSense, I've got a nice syntax highlighting. We'll click on that. I can come down, learn about string interpolation that we saw that Mads Torgerson talked about. I can learn all the new features about C Sharp here. It's actually a playground. And then what we've done is we've linked them. So you can go 
not only watch the videos at the .NET website, not only look at the documentation, but then click and go to the next module, go from strings to numbers and on and on and on. And what we're hoping folks are gonna do, because making these is really easy, I'd love to see you do some courseware. If you maybe have a, um, a, uh, a code camp or you're having a, a .NET organization or a .NET user group of your own, you're gonna maybe put on a .NET conf at your local, uh, your local community center. You just go and make these dibs with the .NET Interactive Notebooks. I can add new chunks of code, add new markdown. The markdown is really, really e easy. And then when we just go in like that, I forgot the thing for the markdown, what the title is. I always forget about it. There you go. There's a title. See? This is some text. And then I can go and add the code down here and do whatever. Really, really cool stuff. They've got some good YouTubes and you can see some talks from Maria, who we saw earlier today showing you the power of this. This is just the beginning, and this has got .NET Interactive, which is hosting the .NET runtime that we all know and love at its heart. .NET Interactive is super powerful, and you can see here that it even supports C Sharp and F Sharp, and then you can have multi-language notebooks where you've got HTML, JavaScript, and other things, and PowerShell all inside of one notebook. Imagine delivering your courseware in this way and teaching folks how to code C Sharp, and then they graduate to Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio itself. I think that's pretty cool. A lot of people don't realize that that exists. I would encourage you to check it out. Again, that's at .net.microsoft.com slash learn to code or dot.net slash learn to code. And those notebooks are all, again, open source and you can check them out. And when you go and um, uh, create those URLs, you can actually launch Visual Studio Code directly. So I'm in a browser right here and I'm gonna click that and that's gonna launch directly into Visual Studio Code. So if you're a teacher, isn't that nice that you can go and say, look at the syllabus, they click and it hops from browser into VS Code, and then they have this great experience inside of notebooks. And then we're also looking at notebooks in Visual Studio uh, for Windows as well. We've got plugins for that. So be looking at for an improved experience there in the future as well. Now, a couple of days ago, David Fowler went and tweeted, what would you ex where would you not expect to see um, se a mention in a .NET talk? Like what, um, what technologies would you maybe not expect to be, uh, to be seen? Uh, so I put together a list of some cool stuff that's happening in the .NET community that I wanna show kind of at the end of here of the first day of .NET Conf as we get ready to go into the party. Um, so before I do that, I wanna just remind you that you just go to .NET, you click download. You see that the .NET 6 release is the LTS or the long-term support release. If you click down here, click down here where it says all .NET 6 downloads, that might give you some interesting places that you wouldn't expect to see .NET. Look at this. We got Mac, we got Linux, we got Windows, we got ARM 64, we got Windows ARM 64, we got ARM 32, we got Alpine, which is a great uh, small distribution used in containers. I've got here a, uh, a Surface Pro X. So I've got ARM 64 running on this tiny device here. I can write my .NET code and I can be assured that it's gonna run great on any device, including my Surface Pro X like this. Fantastic little device, but when we think about ARM, right, we think about low power, we think about small, we think about power sipping. I've got a couple other ones here as well. I've got a Raspberry Pi. So I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 right here, runs a full version of Raspbian. I can run different alternative distros here, also runs .NET, works great. In fact, we've got some friends like PyTop that have a Raspberry Pi that actually ships with .NET and with uh, the .NET Interactive Notebook, so that's cool. That's small, that's small. Well, look at this. Just got this today. This is a Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Zero Two. The Zero Two, little tiny $15 processor. This happens to be an ARM 8 processor. .NET supported on ARM 7 and up. So this little $15 guy right here, he's got HDMI, he's got a little disc there, he's got two USBs, one for power and one for a hub. That runs .NET as well. This is great for IoT projects, which are super cool, but it's worth pointing out that something like this is a microprocessor. This runs a full operating system, and that might be overkill for what you're doing. You know, if I'm just turning lights on and off, a Raspberry Pi is too much. If I'm just doing something small in my garage and I wanna make something happen with my, um, my Raspberry Pi, maybe turn on my watering outside, this might too, be too much. This is a microprocessor. Wouldn't it be cool to do something with a microcontroller? 
Take a look at this. Our friends at nanoframework.net uh, have got easy C-sharp code in embedded systems. Again, this is great work that's happening in the community, whether it be open source or small businesses, making it easy to write code for embedded systems. These embedded systems will actually in integrate directly with Visual Studio, so you can press F5 and drop into the code on one of these tiny devices, a microcontroller being much smaller and much more single tasked and much more power efficient than a microprocessor that runs an entire operating system. So kudos to our friends at Nano Framework. Another cool one is Wilderness Labs. Wilderness Labs has this thing here. Wilderness Labs has the Meadow process, the Meadow processor. And the Meadow processor, after a successful Kickstarter, is now a business. And look at this, Wilderness Labs, that is a .NET application. I happen to flash this device, this tiny microcontroller from WSL. I'm gonna have a blog post about this soon and you can take a look at the WSL blog. Uh, WSL now has support for USB over IP so that you can plug a device into Windows. Even if Windows doesn't have drivers for it, we'll be able to talk to it directly from Linux. But of course our friends at Meadow have great integration with Visual Studio. So I was able to write C Sharp, hit F5, and show this picture of Tux and WSL directly on this device. And the screen is from our friends at Adafruit. And this has all been put together with their, their system. So kudos to them, both Nano Framework and our friends at Wilderness Labs. That's somewhere you wouldn't expect to see, .NET. That Raspberry Pi Zero, pretty cool. You can do cameras, you can do on-chip um, uh, machine learning. Again, just $15, great little project. We've got system.devices.io, which is really, really cool. We talked about how PowerShell 7.2 is built on .NET 6, and they ship the same day, which is cool. I want to showcase some companies and some other folks that are doing great stuff in the .NET space. Uno platform at platform.uno is really cool. This is a UI platform. Again, not associated with Microsoft, just doing great work with the great software stack, the great open source software stack that they were given. They've got a conference coming up soon, UnoConf. These folks have the ability to go and run C-sharp and XAML with WebAssembly, desktop, and mobile. And here's a cool example where we've got a calculator, like a Windows calculator running in the browser. Isn't that great? Very, very cool, built with the Uno platform. So, you know, you might see stuff like this. You think about Blazor. There's a lot of cool community folks doing great works with Blazor. Here's a one-man shop, one-person shop, blazor-university.com. Person put together a whole website with an invaluable resource on how to learn Blazor. I love it when I see community folks building software and teaching us how to use our own products. It makes me happy. You can also do a lot of this work in the browser. Blazor not only runs everything in the browser, but when you put the power of the cloud on the back end, you've got folks like our friends at Gitpod.io, where I've taken my Hanselman website, and I can go and click on that website, open that up, look at that workspace, and then load it up into an instance of a VS Code-like environment. It pulls that container image down, and I've got the power to develop software in the cloud. Those are, that's a company called Gitpod. You might think that that's quite similar to things like um, code spaces, very similar concept. This idea of what's the responsibility of the cloud? What is the responsibility of my browser? If you're on a, a Chromebook or a low power device, you've got just a browser available to you. Take a look at solutions like this. When I go and start up my code space, you can see here that I've got Visual Studio Code. I'm actually right back where I was editing my website. I can open up that stuff, see it directly here, and even set breakpoints, which is fantastic. And I've got a terminal. You can tell that it's a real terminal because I can run HTOP, and you see I haven't left my browser, which is really, really cool. Uh, we've also got our friends at Progress Telerik that are making some really, really cool stuff, something that they just came out with a couple weeks ago, the REPL, Read, Evaluate, Print Loop. REPLs are real popular for learning things. They have a REPL for Blazor that you can check out. You actually write the code for Blazor in the browser, hit run, they'll compile the assembly and they'll ship the assembly down in real time. And they've got all kinds of samples, asset managers, and you can build your website inside of here and play with those great controls that our friends at Progress Telerik have. And then a shout out to some smaller folks because not everyone's got a big million dollar company. We just put out a tweet saying, hey, who, who would you not expect to see in a .NET Comp keynote or lock note? One person shop, friends at Turner Software, problem solvers doing cool stuff with .NET. Here's a company, Iron Man Software. They do some PowerShell stuff, website, their flagship product built on .NET. Um, uh, positive wise, uh, they tweeted me and said that they're doing their work in .NET, front end and back end work. Quibu, they're doing work in .NET. Alchemy, doing digital banking in .NET. We've got a Silver Key Tech, 
their technology stack, ASP.NET Core. They're using uh, Vue.js. They're using Blazor. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, Madcap Software. These are all folks that are having fun and doing cool, productive work in .NET, and that just makes me smile. Uh, here's another great one, another small business, Sixlabors.com. Sixlabors.com, you've probably heard of them because you've heard of ImageSharp, one of the great 2D graphics libraries, uh, open source with a great license, and you've got you know manipulation of graphics and drawing, as well as ASP.NET Core manipulation middleware. Good, good product that's used by a lot of folks. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, and then also, as I get to the end here, we turn back to Jamie and get ready for our party. I want to just remind you that if you go to the .NET website, you click on Learn. We've got books. We've got architectural guides. We've got PDFs. We've got videos galore. We want to make sure that you can find a happy face of somebody who seems friendly to you, who's going to teach you how to use .NET in cool places like Unity, like on a Mac, in machine learning, in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like Apache Spark. Uh, we've got F Sharp. We've got C Sharp. We're having all kinds of fun. And um, I even, I've been using this remarkable device here. It's called Remarkable 2. It's an e-ink device. Turns out, runs Linux, runs ARM. I went and installed .NET Core and .NET on this Remarkable. I actually ran .NET 5 on this device. So .NET in so many amazing places that you would not expect. And now I will exhale because that is .NET everywhere. I hope that didn't suck. No, that was amazing. Wow, Scott. I, there are some... Uh... These companies I didn't even know were using .NET, so this was an experience for me too. Yeah, I even I got I got my Surface Duo, so I got Android devices. You've oh, got an wow. iPhone, so like .NET runs everywhere, you know, anywhere at all. Uh, Samsung TVs, right? It's is, there. Is there anywhere you didn't show it running? <laughs> uh, I don't have a TV. That would have been cool. That would have been. That yeah, been I would have cool. brought a Tizen TV. Icing on the cake. Yeah, that would have been the icing on the cake. Yeah. So it runs on TVs too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of great work on that. There's a lot of processors that people don't realize it runs on. Um, it's just a great flexible runtime, and we want people to know that. We want people to tell us when they do something cool and they use it in a way that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I just want to kind of get people thinking about like, oh, wow, I could use it here. I could use it there. And what else can we do with it? Yeah, yeah. I could embed, like, you know, a lot of the ways that .NET is being used in games with things like Unity is as an, uh, an embedded engine yeah. through things like Mono, right? So it can be uh, the engine for your game. It could draw the graphics for your game. It's really up to you. Wow. Well, that was absolutely amazing. As you could see, Scott showed us, uh, .NET really does run everywhere. Um, we don't really have time for questions, but folks seem to really like your shirt. Um, they're very excited about your... Uh, Isn't that funny? You work so hard for hours and hours and hours. You put together a whole talk, shirt. and it's like, but the shirt, but where can I buy that? Great. Can I think I you that? actually did tweet about where you could find the shirt. Yeah, I think people can probably find that stuff out there. And, of course, the T-shirt bots will find it if, uh, if you don't want to. Good, I'm glad. Uh, they're telling us that we actually got a couple of seconds for questions here. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, people are really liking the embedded system. That makes me happy. We see people mentioning Nano Framework and our friends at Wilderness Labs. They didn't expect to see that, right? You don't realize, like, how is that device, on, you know, it's underpowered. How can you do .NET on that? You know, you're doing AOT or ahead of time compilation, doing some really creative things to get that language that you love and that, um, that environment that you love down onto a device that's so tiny, tiny, tiny devices. Yeah, they're, they're so miniature. Yeah, they're, they're systems on a chip. You know, you might have four megs of RAM. You might have eight megs of RAM. And to be able to go and do those things and then put it on a battery and it could run for days and days or even for months. Wow. Yeah, they're There's doing a lot, a lot of, of great use work. cases here. There is. Let's see. Do we have any more questions? Just everyone's so excited about your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think the other thing to point out is the interactive notebooks, if I don't, if you don't mind. Yeah, Remarkable, you can use them Remarkable as well. And then, of course, interactive notebooks, which is a really great point, right? Um, I feel like that's a thing that we, we can't tell people about enough because if you drop someone into File New Project, you know, you and I have taught classes on this before, and it's like, eh, ignore the using there and use, ignore the namespace and ignore the class and ignore the public static void main, right? I think implicit usings make that easier, implicit globals make that nice, minimal APIs. You can get a lot of that ceremony out of the way, mm -hmm. then you teach them the stuff, and then you bring the ceremony back in slowly. slowly. But the idea of an interactive book is such a great innovation, and then the work that that team has done to actually make that code uh, have HTML, JavaScript, PowerShell, C Sharp, F Sharp, all in the same notebook and all work together. I didn't show it, but you can do really cool visualizations, like you and I talked about the New York Times, like graphs that move in D3JS, running uh, .NET code that's doing the data access for you. So really all cool in stuff. Internet, uh, all in interactive notebooks? All in interactive notebooks running inside of Visual Studio Code. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, we actually have a, a C Sharp interactive notebook. We do. So if you go to dot, .net slash learn to code, uh, we had an intern this summer and she went and took all of our videos that we did together, yes. right? And then she wrote notebooks for all of them. So you can actually watch our videos at dot, dot .net slash videos and then follow along in the notebooks, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and for those uh, watching who don't maybe know as much about IoT and all the fabulous devices that you were showing, we also have a letslearn.net, and you can learn about IoT, machine learning. Uh, we walk through uh, Microsoft Learn modules, um, and you can get credit for those, and uh, just more ways to learn. Um, and I think IoT was one of my favorites, personally. All right, fantastic. <laughs> so we're having all kinds of fun uh, here at .NET Conf. I guess it's virtual party time, right? Is that right? Yeah, don't go anywhere. It's time for the, the party, the code party. We have Jeff Fritz, Richard Campbell over in our Channel 9 studios. They're getting prepped and ready to go because we're about to have the code party. Thank you. Oh, there's going to be prizes. Uh, they're doing quizzes, trivia. Yep. It's, it's going to be a blast. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us here today. It has been a wild adventure learning all about .NET 6 and BS 2022. Scott, thank you so much for hosting me with me. It's been a blast. And more importantly, thank you to everyone in the studio. We've got everyone a whole host studio. of people working very hard, both here, both seen and unseen. We appreciate you and all of your very hard efforts. Thank you very much. This has been day one. Woo!